name is Maurice Washington. I want to welcome everybody to another episode of Executive Talk. Those who are watching live or those who are watching later on our Roku channel or listening on our podcast, thank you guys for all joining us. In today's show, we're going to talk about 2023 commercial property trend trends. As you know, post-COVID, a lot of the industries have changed quite a bit. Some have taken a big hit. Some have um, seen a big increase. Everything's really uh, all across the board. But today, we're going to take a, snap, a snapshot into the commercial property trends as they are now and potential outlook as to what we can see in the future. With me today to actually have this discussion that I have Rick Calloway and also Peter uh, McLennan. Let's go ahead and bring him to the studio. How are you doing, Rick? How are you doing, Peter? Doing just great. Looking forward to a good show. You know how Good morning, is. Maurice. Thanks for having me. Yes, thanks for being here. And again, gentlemen, thank you guys for taking your time out of your schedule. Uh, always the most important value is to talk about the most updated, up-to-date business information and things that are going on. So again, thank you. Um, we are going to talk about the most, and I know Peter, you you deal with these asset classes all the time, and also Rick, as, as far as business insurance is concerned, but multifamily, office, industrial, retail, and hotel. Um, as a 50-foot overview, Peter, where do you feel like, just to take us back from I guess January 2023 up until this point, have you seen a huge shift in the commercial real estate industry? Yeah, well, I think you meant from January of 2020, like pre-COVID to now. Yes, we've had yeah. seen a, a pretty major shift uh, that, um, and it's it's kind of impacted different different sectors of commercial in different ways. So there's um, a, a few major asset class types in commercial real estate. You have multifamily. Um, you have industrial, you have a retail, you have office building. Um, and then a fifth one that we're going to touch on briefly is hospitality or hotels. Um, right. And each of those has been impacted differently and has come back differently as well from the pandemic. And so it'll, it's, so I can't just say in general, um, this is how the market is for across all commercial real estate, because we have to look at each asset class individually and what the market is doing and even more importantly maurice each individual market is going to be different we'll see that in some of the slides we're going to look from all right um, well, let's go ahead and uh, so. well let's go ahead and get after it. and let's talk about multi-family just to get us started um and you provided this article which is fantastic because it really breaks down a lot i'm going to have you know rick really help the audience out um you know dissect this and see what's going on so in multifamily, it's saying the multifamily sector continues to slow down from its record highs in 2021. At the national level, the absorption of units dropped by 18.7 percentage points from the last quarter. The national vacancy rate moved up to 6.7% in the first quarter of 2023, a notable increase from the 5% in the first quarter of 2022, but still on par with the pre-pandemic levels. Now, just to go into this next paragraph, which is which I feel like is huge, uh, rent prices are still higher than they were a year ago, but the gains have returned to more no normal levels. Now, um, obviously, that's a lot to chew on. It, it seems like more of an investor-heavy situation. Um, how, how, how are we to interpret that, Peter? Yeah, and so just to let the audience know, we're, we're discussing a report from the National Association of Realtors. They're they do some great commercial re research. And so we're looking at a report. Um, the most recent report available as of the filming of this is from April of 2023. And um, so what's going on right now, uh, rent prices have gone up. And that's, I mean, rent prices go up due to inflation, wage growth. Those are, um, wage growth is a great, good thing. Inflation, not so much, but um, as landlord costs increase, rent prices are going to increase as well. So that's why we see the trend going up. We do see rent prices slowly um, are increasing at a slower rate, which is what the article indicates here, uh, just 2.5% year over year, uh, as opposed to 5.6% in 2022. Um, so the what we're seeing in the multifamily space is um, there's been a, a change in where the demand is. Uh, for a long time, the demand was to be in big city centers, but I think COVID uh, impacted some people's mentality around that. They didn't like being trapped in an apartment with no access to outdoor space, um, the The difficulty of navigating an elevator uh, during COVID was a ch challenge in some of the high-rise buildings. 
And so right. you saw people fleeing the urban centers to go to more suburban. And if we look at the 10, um, 10 areas with the fastest rent growth, most sure. of them are more suburban communities. Um, you okay. know, you've got Peoria, Illinois, Fayetteville, North Carolina. Um, they're more suburban in nature, less high rise, less dense. And that's where um, <clears throat> rent growth has been increasing because demand is stronger in those locations. Now, okay. if we scroll down a little bit farther in the report, we see that the top 10 areas with the strongest 12 month absorption, um, a lot of those are major metro metropolitan areas because um, companies are saying, hey, you need to live close to where you work and you need to come in a certain number of days. And so people are having to actually move back close to their employment centers. Uh, but you're also just, I think it's a little bit, people are a little bit, um, now that the pandemic has been declared over for the most part, uh, they, there is a, a more co a greater level of comfortability about living in some of these urban areas as well. And so what was a, a great amount of vacancy is now being absorbed or, or being filled back up um, by tenants. Okay, got it. All right. Um, so Rick, what's your insight um, in regards to this article from a business insurance perspective? From the insurance perspective, it's a scrambling market. The vacancies cause issues for the landlords and for the insurance companies. Uh, property market, because of all of the things that have gone on, is very difficult. And unfortunately, insurance is now a contributor to the rent increase because the premiums are skyrocketing. So I'm, I'm one of the bad guys that's causing the rent increases. Yeah. And that, go ahead, Rick. Uh, go ahead, Peter. Sorry about that. Well, that, I was going to say that's a very valid point. Insurance premiums, and we're uh, Rick and I are both based in California, and insurance is becoming increasingly challenging in California, um, with major insurers pulling out of the market, um, and uh, so it's going to be it may be increasingly challenging for uh, owners to find insurance in the conventional market. They're going to have to go to um, the excess lines, which can be more expensive, and um, it's also gonna that's gonna impact rental rates for those um uh for those properties because then the landlords are not going to want to lose money on insurance yeah that's fair so even speaking of that rick um and this is feel like it's just most recent um ha have, have we seen an aggressive pull out of the market from uh, insurance companies across the nation in the states like California and Florida, they're starting to pull pull out. California, most recently, we lost three, four major carriers, or they're staying here, but they're not accepting any new business. So, gotcha. where there's less, but you know, I'm surprised the Midwest, where there's tornadoes and hurricanes, they they're not losing uh, insurers, but probably that's because they can underwrite that. They're consistent. They know every year the hurricane's going to come through and blow all the houses down so that they account for that. But wildfires, floods, you, you know, you can't, you can't predict that. So you can't price yeah. it properly. So you have to come back next year or two years later and go, okay, we're out of money. We got to build up, build up our coffers. Gotcha. All right. Well, let's take it to, um, to this next one, this next, next asset class, which is office. And I'm gonna go ahead and go through this because I know this is a major deal for a lot of business owners. Uh, so an office are saying with a hybrid work arrangement to be a new normal for many companies, the office sector is continuing to struggle. The demand for, the demand for office space has decreased resulting to more available spaces for lease on the market. So now, Peter, when you think about that, because yes, uh, Rick and I, we've done a couple of shows in regards to the hybrid working space. That is a new phenomenon. I feel like that's not going back anytime soon. As a matter of fact, I feel like it may shift more towards that way on a more frequent frequent basis. How how are investors, how are business owners adjusting to this? Yeah, I would say that office has probably been the most negatively impact asset class uh, for commercial real estate. There's been recent articles on that. Um, and the hybrid workspace, the hybrid work, I don't think is going away. People enjoy being able to work from home. 
Um, one article I read recently said that they think that maybe having a Tuesday through Thursday schedule for a lot of places is going to be the norm. And that means that Monday and Friday they can work from home or work remote, wherever that may be. Uh, but what um, if we go back to the report, we see that there's quite a bit of vacancy in office space in a number of various different markets. Uh, but what this vacancy number is, is capturing the true vacancy is not capturing the utilization because in many of these markets, at least in San Francisco itself, the utilization of office space is much larger that the um, there are not there are there are vast swaths of office buildings and office properties that are currently under lease and the tenant is paying the lease, but they have almost no one in the property on a daily basis or a regular basis. Um, uh, you know, I, I've heard of one's office space, which has 10,000 feet, and there's about four people that go in there on a regular basis. Right. So, right. so which is, which is way underutilized. So the question is going to become, what happens to these offices when the leases expire? Um, and then also it's going to be, a, it's going to impact, I believe, when the loans on these office buildings come due. Uh, because loans for office buildings are not, we oftentimes we think through that the financing is the same as for a single family house. It's 30 year fixed rate financing. That's not the case with most commercial financing. Most commercial financing is done on a shorter time period. And it's, um, it is amortized or paid down, but generally it's done on five, seven, 10 year terms. So some of these properties could have been financed in 2018, 2019, early 2020 before the pandemic hit. And they were done on five year terms. And those, those notes are not coming due till um, this year, uh, next year, or maybe even 20, early 2025. And um, if they're done on a five year basis, which is pretty common, uh, so so those loans will come due at some point and the lenders, if there's a large amount of vacancy in those properties, the lenders are going to be hesitant, hesitant to lend on them. They're going to want the owners to have um, greater reserves. They're going to look at the cash flow. And so as these leases, we call it, we say they burn off, they basically the leases expire and the tenants decide what they're going to do. Are they going to renew the lease? Are they going to renegotiate for the same amount of space, but a lower cost? Or are they going to give the space back and say, hey, we, we can we can consolidate and, and move all of our employees to one building or or, hey, we have 10,000 feet now, but we really only need four or we only need 6,000 square feet. And therefore, right. now the landlord has all this excess space that creates more vacancy and that's going to affect their um, their loan covenants. It's going to affect their ability to finance and it's going to consequently cause, a, I believe, a drop in the office. Uh, property value. And we've actually, we're starting to see that a little bit close to where Rick and I in San Francisco, a building just is reportedly being sold for, I think a 75% discount um, in wow. downtown oh. San Francisco. And the other complicating factor is that it's not even being financed. It's, they had to bring in an all cash equity partner to close this deal uh, because most of the banks don't want to touch office at the current time. So mm. it's a challenging environment for um, office. And um, I'm sure, and as vacancies increase, it'll it'll be a challenge to see what happens um, and, and where things go. Vacant office buildings, vacant properties in general, Rick can tell you are a blight and uh, unfortunately big buildings need to be used. Uh, toilets need to be flushed. People need to be, the air conditioning system needs to be run. All of that has to happen for a building to kind of be functioning and maintain itself. Otherwise there's decay and insurers don't like to insure vacant buildings. Um, <laughs> oftentimes they'll charge a premium for that, that they, they that they're literally will charge higher rates for vacant properties. And so, um, so it's going to be a challenge for these office investors. Um, I will say on the flip side that if, if a company or um, a business owner is considering a lease in an office space, now might be a good time to get some concessions, maybe upgrade your office space, move from a class B or C property, maybe to a class A and, and pay somewhat similar rent. Um, uh, 
you know, that you might be able to get some concessions, maybe get nicer features or, or because these landlords are going to be clamoring for occupancy, they want to have tenants, they're competitive. So, you know, it's, it's important to find a, a good real estate broker who knows your local market and have them help you negotiate in that market. Yeah, Peter, that, that you brought some huge points. So, and Rick, I want you to go ahead and address that because it's with this empty space, what does that look like on your end? From a insurance it looks like a pain in the it looks like a pain in the neck for insuring them. Not only do they charge a premium, like Peter mentioned, mold and all those kind of things that happen when the building's not used. I have to read the policies very carefully because I may get a good price but they exclude things like mold, which is likely to happen in a vacant building or vandalism. Right. So that's the problem with the excess and surplus lines market. That's why you definitely have to work with a experienced insurance broker. You can't just look at prices. You have to work with someone who wants to understand what's being insured. Yeah, I can call Geico 15 minutes and I'll save you 15%. I can do that all day long. It'll be cheaper, but you won't have any coverage. Most important in insurance, obviously we're all concerned with price, but you have to have the proper coverage. I got a question for Peter though. That guy that bought that building at that 75% discount, is he expecting things to come back in the future? And why would uh, well, they can I, I, <laughs> yeah, so I think that what the analysis I read is that the price per square foot that he's purchasing this, this high rise office building, he can be very competitive with almost every building in San Francisco at the price he's purchasing it. Um, and because he's all cash, he can also be patient. Um, and the, the investor was from a foreign country. Uh, the, the all cash investor was like out of like a foreign investor. And, um, because of that, they are, um, uh, they look at the relative value of property in other parts of let's say asia and the value of property in san francisco and still on a, a comparable scale like san francisco still is an attractive price whereas maybe other parts of the country are looking at san francisco prices and saying that's crazy money but these people are looking at like well what can i get in singapore versus what can i get in san francisco and this is a good value for on that scale right like comparing one place to another um, on that realm where we might look like, oh, the cost of an office building in Houston, Texas is way down here and San Francisco is way up here. It doesn't make any sense, even though it's 75% off, but they're looking at like, well, San Francisco's here, but Singapore is up here. So it does make sense for us to go to San Francisco. Um, so that's one thing. I think the other thing that we, we didn't talk about a little bit is, uh, and one of the commenters asked about construction. Uh, it, there's some talk about converting some of these office buildings to multifamily. So mm -hmm. taking an existing office building, converting the structure uh, to, to multifamily, changing the use, there will be obviously some zoning issues uh, for those. There's also um, not every building will work. Uh, the floor plate or the size of the um, building structure has to um, has to be right for in order to accommodate this and the building has to have windows on like pretty much four sides so those are going to be factors that are going to go into converting any of these office buildings to a multi-family multi-tenant residential use um, and the other thing that's going to be impactful is the the fees the fees that cities charge mm -hmm. um, per residential unit and right. whether the cities make it affordable for a developer to make that conversion or the cost of the office building gets so low that um that it, it makes sense economically right like you have to pay for like a developer that wants to do this or or construct a project like this is going to have to uh first uh pay for the building itself and then finance all the construction costs on top of that so there becomes this layering of costs and then they want to make a profit on top of the cost to acquire, the cost to convert. And so they're going to make a profit on top of that. So then that can drive up the prices. And so you have to get the, the, the asset at a very low cost. We've all seen construction costs shoot up, uh, in the past, uh, in the past, uh, uh, two years, uh, some mostly due to supply chain issues, but we've seen the the cost of construction shoot up and, um, it's tapering off some, but we, it'll be interesting to see what happens going forward. All right. 
that's fair. Uh, thank you for, for that amount of detail, gentlemen. Um, also, I want to bring up this other asset class because, again, I know multifamily office are huge because that's where we see a lot of it. But I know industrial, they're going through it as well. Um, from this article that you provided for us, Peter, is saying that although demand may have slowed down in the industrial sector compared to the previous year, the amount of industrial space absorbed remains twice as high as pre-pandemic levels. In the last 12 months ending in March, uh, net absorption reached almost 362 million square footage. As a result, this sector had the lowest, the second lowest vacancy rate at 4.3% after the retail sector. So uh, yet again, Peter, make some sense out of that for us and then we'll bring it back to you and see how it looks out of the business insurance. Ahead, sure. Yeah. So uh, when we all got locked in our homes, what did we do? How did we how did we get things? Well, we all went online, right? We all turned to Amazon or Kohl's.com or, you know, pick your favorite retailer. And we went online and, and bought stuff, um, probably a to make ourselves feel better. But that was also the only way we were going to buy supplies. So right. we um, <laughs> we had to we had to. Um, so these big retailers shifted their model a lot. Some of them shifted from having lots of uh, retail locations that they decided to have like lots of industrial locations. So Amazon was one of the fastest growing industrial users and they were buying location. They wanted to rent locations closer and closer and closer to the end consumer, because if you have Amazon prime, you want it delivered in one day or you want it delivered in two days because right. you don't want to wait for it. And so um, if you see many of these areas with the strongest 12 months absorption from our report, they are close to uh, major metropolitan areas where there's a large population base. Um, and, um, you know, Dallas, Chicago, Houston, Phoenix, Indianapolis, Atlanta, all of these for the most part are close to major metropolitan areas and that way the deliveries can be made in one day or or two days at the most to the end consumer and so um uh it's very important for these retailers and these these sellers to be close to where the consumers are and so that's why you've seen the absorption here um uh in those major metropolitan areas um and logistics space, which is space where, let's say you get a, a load of um, supplies from a container, that container is brought to a logistics location, it's unloaded, and then they distribute all of that to maybe three different trucks that are going to different locations. Um, so Target will bring a load of clothes in, for instance, uh, you know, a retailer will bring a load of clothes in, they will unload all of those clothes, and then they will distribute it to, to three or four different stores. So, or, or a dozen of stores, whatever it may be. Um, so that's kind of the logistics space. It comes in one side a lot of times and then goes out the other. And, and so yeah. the spaces are actually designed for there to be trucks parked on either side and they can just bring it in one side and then load it up on the other side and go straight across. So, and that's what's had the strongest um, demand and, and the rent prices have gone up by, you know, 10.3% year over year. There's limited availability um in that market and we've also seen low cap rates as well the other factor that's included in the industrial are the the trades people um think plumbers construction uh yeah. those type of industries and yeah. many of them were very busy during the pandemic people saw they were home all day they're looking at their walls and they're saying man this does not i don't like the way this looks i want to change it and so <laughs> they hire that contractor they hire that plumber and those guys need space for their vans, for their, you know, construction materials to keep their equipment safe. They don't want thieves breaking into their trucks and stealing stuff. So they need uh, buildings with roll up doors um, to park their trucks in, to park materials, to keep equipment safe. And so that as well as kept demand high. Uh, so, so um, industrial has maintained its price um, in general. Uh, it has been a less favorable asset class in the eyes of many investors. And that's why the cap rate for industrial is higher than say for multifamily um, as well. Industrial has a longer um, 
lease cycle generally multifamily the lease cycle is every year you generally renew every year whereas industrial is going to be on a three five seven ten year cycle and so that it doesn't adjust as well for inflation and since we've been in a, a higher inflation uh, environment i think investors are a little bit wary to jump in with a really low cap rate uh, at the current time because they don't want to get beat up by inflation and not having their uh return adequate to the the risk that they're that they're taking on yeah that's fair rick what do you have to say on the matter when it comes to industrial what have you seen well what i see when amazon when amazon comes in and buys a building it doesn't do any good because they've got their own insurance <clears throat> the dust the logistics centers they're a risk because of the trucks going in and out the traffic and all that but they're not normally owned by the targets or whatever they're owned by a, a third party and the shops where the carpenters and plumbers and all that are they very rarely own their buildings they're owned by someone else so they're risky because they've got a lot of stuff going in and out and the insurance on the property and the liability is carried by the business owner and they're required to have some insurance but got to got to be careful with those things i'm getting out more to check these buildings which i couldn't do during covid because right. especially when you've got a risk like a painter it's got lots of paint stored up in there that's a small fire risk or machine shops sometimes get sloppy they'll keep their lubricants and stuff too too near all the equipment and that's a fire hazard so people people tend to get sloppy when they don't have to pay for the insurance they have a liability policy if there's a problem they get stuck with it but then it's the lawyers get to make money because in those situations everybody gets sued gotcha man yeah a lot of changes gentlemen a lot of changes um this one is a big one and i know this particular asset class has been affected which is retail i'm gonna bring this up and let's go ahead and discuss this on so retail space retail space demands demand remains strong, although absorption may have been decreased since last year, the current vacancy rates are lower than both last year and pre pandemic. In fact, retail currently boasts the lowest vacancy rate among all the commercial real estate sectors and 4.2%. Um, by type of real retail stores, general retail and neighborhood centers have driven the demand accounting for nearly 90% of the net absorption in Q1 to 2023. So um, this graph is huge. Actually, everything is, but this one really sticks out to me because when I look at this here, Peter, um, and this is, and to me, it's just my perspective, but when I look at this, I see everything else, I guess, per se, flourishing, but then I see malls diminishing in value as far as, um, I think that, I feel like it's decreasing year, year over year, but um, go ahead, expound upon that and let us know. Yeah, so I, I mean, I think the places that you're seeing uh, expand general retail neighborhood centers, um, even power centers, those are the places oftentimes those have places where you go for an experience or you go for something that you can't get somewhere else. You go there to get uh, your hair done. You go for a unique dining experience. You go for a unique entertainment experience. Maybe go see a movie, maybe go to an escape room. Uh, maybe maybe you're going um, uh, because there's your favorite like restaurant there, <clears throat> you're you're going to these general retail, these neighborhood centers for those place things that you can't buy online, because uh, you know oftentimes, and I'm, I've mentioned this before, but a lot of times the people will go to a um, a uh, a store, they will try on two or three pairs of shoes or two or three pairs of pants find the one that's the right size or the right style that they like and then they'll go online and look and buy and see if they can buy that and so that uh the the mall is becoming less important as the place to go and buy your things it's more a uh, place to go maybe for social or for a fun afternoon um but i think too that unfortunately the malls in recent and i don't know if this is this is me speculating i don't know if there's any um uh, like data behind this but malls have been targets in recent years of of um 
mass casualty incidents. And so I think maybe there's just a perception that they're not as safe as they used to, less desirable to go to. Um, a lot of them were built um, 20, 30, 40 years ago. And so the design and, and the taste of consumers has changed. And so what the mall offered, um, you almost, what you could would go to the mall for to buy you know, various things from various different stores. Well, now we have online retailers that do that for us, right? We go online, we, get, we log into Amazon and we can buy the book that we want. We can buy the clothes that we want. And we can also get that cooking utensil that, you know, we didn't have um, that we saw on that cooking show um, <laughs> and get it all delivered to us within two days. I don't even have to go. I don't even have to leave my house. Right. You know, um, and, and it all comes to me. It's delivered in two days. I don't have to spend any money on gas uh, or anything like that. And I don't have to go to the hassle. And so I think, <clears throat> I think malls are declining. Um, it's been, it's been a trend. Um, recently here locally, we saw a major mall investor is, is basically turning their property in San Francisco over to the lenders and saying here, you can have it back. Um, San Francisco, I think is suffering in a unique way uh, and that they are uh, losing retailers. Their, their office vacancy is very high, uh, especially the utilization rate. And there may even be a trend of, of people still moving out of San Francisco. Um, uh, not wanting to live there. And that's due in fact to the, we will, I'm sure Rick can touch on this, but the blight, um, uh, that the blight that is coming when you have a bunch of vacant buildings, it's dangerous to walk by a number like vacant buildings, you know, like if you don't have people, if you don't have energy or eyes, eyeballs in the sense to see what's going on, it, it makes you not feel safe. Right. And, yes, and so, right. so having large swaths of the, uh, landscape be vacant is, is, is challenging. Um, also in some of these retail leases, there are clauses that, uh, that if a certain retailer, usually a big box retailer goes out, um, other tenants in that space can either begin to pay a reduced rent or can cancel their lease and leave. And so sometimes it can be a domino effect that, Hey, um, this big retailer, and I used one, I used one that made you guys laugh, but I said, Hey, Mervin's Mervin's, uh, went out of business. Now I can pay less rent in my shopping center because they're gone. Um, I just don't want to throw any of the current retailers under the bus, but yeah. like, Hey, this is a, this is a, <laughs> this, this big tenant that had a lot of, that drew a lot of people. Well, my little, my little coffee shop or my little juice, juice bar is not going to be getting enough foot traffic. So now I should be able to pay a reduced rent because, because Mervin's is gone. They're not drawing all those kids that would come and buy their school clothes. And then mom would buy him a, a soda or a juice and I'm not going to make as much money. Therefore I can't pay you as much rent. And then it becomes a perpetuated cycle. Right? Yes. Yep. That's exactly it. Um, Rick, what about you? How do you see that? Um, the cause and effect from an insurance perspective. Well, we talked about the blight and the vacancies. They're unattractive to insurance companies. They're target, they're eyesores, they're targets for vandalism. Uh, yes. It's and for the first time that I can remember, they you know, they've always rated a building on how old it is and all that kind of stuff. Now they're giving buildings crime scores. If you have uh, too high a crime score, you can't get insurance. But it's like I said, the property market in California is terrible for any reason you can think of. I have noticed a slight trend on, I go to a local mall here because my grandkids like one of the restaurants, but I see all the places that have entries on the street level, they still have a lot of traffic, but I see very little traffic going to the inside. So maybe malls need to figure out how to make everything you know accessible from the outside i don't have to walk around through the inside i don't know how you yep. do that structurally it's probably a problem but that's where the traffic is you know there's like three restaurants there are people plenty of traffic there there's a uh, gym there which i walk by very quickly because i don't want it to infect me and force me to go work out but it has traffic so the outside outside entries 
are attractive to people still, but they don't want to go inside and walk around and and be, you know, possibly get stuck in con some kind of shooting or it's, you know, it's a scary world we live in now. It is, it is, there's a lot going on. Um, on this note, um, Nicholas Walker um, brought up a question for us and uh, he wants to know, uh, let's talk about multifamily residential um, and industrial in I think Arkansas and Texas. Uh, do you have any insight on that, Peter? Um, I don't have a ton of insight on that, Nicholas, unfortunately. Um, obviously, the report that we brought up uh, indicated that um, in uh, Dallas, it was one of the highest absorption rates from, for industrial. And then also one of the slower in industrial absorption rates was Little Rock, Arkansas. Um, so those were both mentioned in the report. Um, I, I, I specialize mostly in San Francisco Bay Area and around there. I have uh, other professionals in those areas that I can refer you to um, to get that. Um, those areas, uh, from what from my perspective, which is you know a, half a world away, um, you know you, your market's gonna it's gonna depend a little bit on what you're buying and what you're buying it for and I and I tell this to clients all the time is what you need to have a, a service professional that asks you questions about what your goals are and why are you investing because mm-hmm. uh, if you're investing for cash flow you have one um, set of goals versus if you're investing for appreciation or um, or, or capital growth, you might say, you have a different standard in what you need to be doing and you need to look at different types of buildings. And so having a real estate professional that can work with you to identify what your goals are and what you're looking for is key to, uh, to maximizing and accomplishing the goals that you have uh, with your real estate investments. Um, and so you know, and, and, and I don't, I'm not saying one strategy is right over the other cash flow versus capital gain. I'm just saying like, Hey, you need to be clear on what your strategy is and then have someone help you execute that strategy. Makes a lot of sense. And on that note, let's for bring my, for my, up. Oh, go ahead, Rick. Go ahead. Sorry about that. Those areas are much easier for me to insure because insurance companies like those areas. So the premium for people's insurance purchasing there is much is much less much less of a problem. Gotcha. So there's a low, there's a lower risk in that asset class, right? In the retail. In, in that area, yeah. I got gotcha. you. Okay. All right. Um, let's bring up hotel, and because I know that one's a big one because it's <clears throat> gone through a lot of changes as well, just like anything else. But in the set, it's saying that in the hotel, the hospitality sector continued to advance. At the end of the first quarter of 2023, the hotel occupancy has finally fully recovered from the pre-pandemic level. This concludes the recovery of all three prevailing measures of hotel performance, average daily rate, revenue per available room, and occupancy rate. Now, off the top of my head, Peter and gentlemen, I know it, it comes to me on that the travel industry is starting to pick back up because, you know, again, people are starting to feel a lot more comfortable about flying again, uh, so on and so forth. But also businesses are probably moving a lot differently and, you know, probably utilizing the hotel. But again, Peter, this is more your lane. So talk to me about that. Yeah. And obviously we, um, during the pandemic, uh, hotels were one of the hardest hit sectors. Um, and I think it depends too on what the purpose of the travel was. Uh, many people are still traveling for, uh, vacation for recreation. Uh, but we haven't seen business travel come back to the level that it was before. So what is, what purpose does your, um, hotel serve? Is it mostly servicing business clients that are in town for a big convention or is it serving, uh, is it serving vacationers who are there to see the beach or there to see that unique theme park or some other um, attraction uh, that's local or, or um, again, or they're there for, for business? Because I think we're seeing an impact uh, despairingly. Um, and it, it's great that the hotel industry is coming back. Uh, it's great for those owners. It was very challenging for them. Um, 
you look at the occupancy rate in March of 2021, it was 42.4 percent, which is just, you know, dismal for them. <laughs> um, the and and uh, and now to see that back up to the same level it was in 2020. Um, and that the room rates are back up as well, as well as the, the, uh, revenue per available room is also <laughs> back up. So, so all of those numbers are, are positive on that regard. Um, that means that hotels can get back to making money. Um, but again, it's, it's kind of area specific because the report, all these the details that Maui Island is, um, been one of the most, you know, Maui Island in Hawaii has been one of the most uh, popular, but then San Jose, Santa Cruz and San Francisco, which is again, right in our backyard, um, they feel the impact of the pandemic and they're um, still down 20% on the revenue per available room. But uh, you know, what, what San Francisco does have some travel that people come to see the Golden Gate Bridge and, and other things in San Francisco, but a lot of what people came to San Francisco for or conferences um, and conferences are still down uh, conventions and the convention center is still um, uh, very much underutilized. And so until that business travel kind of picks back up and the, con the conventions and the, and the, the conferences are back in full swing, we may not see a full recovery in some of these markets in the hospitality section. Now I spoke a lot, but Rick's more of an expert on this. He's insured more hotels than I have um, dealt with. So, so Rick, I'll let, turn it back over to you and give your thoughts on it. Thank you. Well, what I see in the hotel industry is exactly what Peter said. The convention center type hotels, they're still suffering because companies have learned in the world of Zoom. I mean, I don't need to fly all my salesmen to San Francisco and all over for a a conference we can do it all over zoom but i have another client that puts on trade shows and his business is starting to come back and those hotels are getting business because they have to go actually look at the thing a car or a whatever so those are coming back up but if it's just strictly a sales conference with presentations you know having been to god knows how many of those things in the past i never went yeah. to the sales convention for to watch the presentations i could hardly wait till one was over so i could get out to eat dinner and go have a cocktail so <laughs> it's, it's a, not a huge benefit of a company to, to fly me all over the country to go eat and drink so there's no right. benefit for them to do these things in person anymore it had just become tradition now it's tradition we can get 40 people in a room on one little screen and get the same message across and people, you might get attendees to that Zoom thing that you wouldn't have gotten to the convention because they couldn't, they didn't want to be away from their families or for whatever. So the hotels rely strictly on convention stuff. It's going to take them a while to come back. That's right. Makes a lot of sense. Uh, Peter, did you have any final thoughts on that? Or is no, I, I, as far as hotel is concerned, I would just say the same thing. It's, it's, yeah. you know, what what does what do corporate appetites become for travel and that's gonna you know and uh, i mean i i always like being face to face um at a table or over coffee or like i prefer that but there's some people who for them it makes sense to do it in a video conference uh call and uh and and to to do their sales that way so so that I think that's a big change that has come from COVID as well, that this the business travel has been impacted um, to a greater degree. Yeah. You know, gentlemen, you gave us a lot of information to digest and all of it is valid and all of it's uh, very much so appreciated. Um, what final thoughts would you give uh, the viewing audience here today, Peter? And then we'll go to you, Rick. Yeah, I would just say that because all of this information is very localized and very, uh, it also depends upon what your investment goals are. It speaks to the need to have professionals on your team and on your side, uh, professionals like Rick, professionals like myself, uh, that can help you understand what risks you're taking on, what the specific market you're looking to invest in offers, what are some of the dangers, what are some of the risks. Um, and having those people involved early in the process is going to be advantageous 
to anyone who's looking to invest in real estate. Um, my primary focus of real estate has been the San Francisco Bay Area and the state of California, but I have a network of professionals that are all over the country. And so if I can't help you myself, then I would be glad to refer you to one of my um, professionals that are in my network as well. So I would just say, get, get, a, get a qualified professional that's in your market to help you assess what's going on there and making those buying or investing decisions. Um, whether you're leasing a property, whether you're, uh, you know, trying to buy something either for your business or, or for an investment purposes, having a professional on your side is key to that process. Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, how about you, Rick? Just like Peter said, most importantly, you need to work with professionals and get them involved early on. You don't want to be buying a building and all of a sudden realize, oh, I don't have any insurance. Then you find out the insurance costs twice as much as you thought it would, especially in California. So get involved early. I fortunately am licensed in all 50 states. I have clientele all over the country, even more so since COVID, I'm getting a lot more interest. So I'm having fun working in all the different states. But when I'm working in Texas, Arkansas, other than California, I work with underwriters that are based in that location because a California underwriter plugs in the information thinking it's California and it's a completely different marketplace. So I have to be very specific when I'm working one of those areas and say, hey, I want an underwriter that's familiar with this area so I don't get some ridiculous price. So work with professionals that'll help you keep yourself out of trouble. I love it. I love it. Thank you, uh, gentlemen, again, as always, for taking the time to uh, deliver this information. I know you guys have busy schedules and I will get you guys back to your schedules and your day uh, again. But this information was invaluable. So thank you, Rick. And thank you, Peter, for, for chiming in. We will see thank you. Thank you, Maurice. Thank you. And for everybody else, I want to thank you guys for taking the time and gals for taking the time to uh, watch this segment. I want you to pause for a minute and think about this one particular thing. One thing that we had and you, what you heard in the discussion is you heard a lot of gray. You heard a lot of good. You heard a lot of maybe not so good, but you heard like something in the middle. That's today's trend. That's today's marketplace because things have changed that dramatically for all the business sectors. When we look at multifamily, office, industrial, retail, and the hotel, these are a lot of shifts that they weren't under before. And so like Peter and like Rick were alluding to, utilize or reach out to professionals in your marketplace that know how to navigate this time. Because some, some people are losing out when they weren't expecting to. When they were winning at one point, they're in a gray area at this point. So again, business owners, professionals, this is why we have content like this to ensure you know who to go to, when to go to, and why to go to them. I want to again, thank you guys for being here. Peter and Rick, we'll see you guys next time, but we all have to get back to work. You guys have a great day.